So, I recorded this video yesterday and I had so many interruptions. <laughs> so it's a new day and I thought I would come out to this park where I could have some seclusion and gather my thoughts and share with you some of the things I wanted to share in this video. And it's such a beautiful day, you guys. It's cloudy and rainy and it's cooler. It smells so good. And these are the perfect kind of days that I love to just sit and ponder and talk about these kind of things. So, so I wanna share an experience that I had actually yesterday after recording the video. It was a part of the video where I was talking about the atonement and all of a sudden I see one of my neighbors coming up the sidewalk with her kids and I just had this feeling, oh no, my son did something. <laughs> now my youngest child, he definitely keeps me on my toes, let's just say that. <laughs> I have to say that out of everything in life, my greatest challenge is probably parenting. And it's not so much parenting at home. I feel like I have a pretty good handle on things at home. It's when we're out in public and I don't really have any control over the environment we're in. And it's kind of the unknown because we're out in public, you never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> so I guess you could say I'm grateful for my children and especially my youngest teaching me how to have patience, how to trust the Lord, <laughs> how to stay calm and how to just let go and let the Lord be in control. So it was one of those moments and I saw my neighbor coming up the driveway and I thought, oh no, what did he do? I felt like we had had a lot of progress during the week. I'd spent so much time with him, helping him teaching him how to use his words when he's angry, you know, those kind of things. And I felt like we were having a lot of progress, so I was really grateful. And then this one moment just sort of changed all of that. Just in a moment, for me, I just kind of felt so devastated and discouraged. So she came to the door and her sweet little daughter had a band-aid on her face and she told me, you know, um, they were playing in the backyard and your son took a hot dog roasting stick and poked her in the face. And I just felt so bad. You know, especially because it was so close to her eye and he could have really done some damage in her eye and he wasn't home at the time, he was at a friend's house and I had no idea and I just felt so bad. And I remember thinking, we have to make this right. I don't know what to do in this moment. All I could do was apologize on his behalf. And later on when he came home, I sat down and talked to him about it. And as we got talking about it, he actually felt really bad and I, from everything that he shared with me, it sounded like it, he was in the moment, he wasn't thinking, he just he was just responding to his feelings and emotions in the moment. And so we talked about that and he, he did, he said he felt really bad and that he wished he could say sorry and he shouldn't have done that. He became really somber and so we decided that we would go take her a gift and that he would write her a card. And because he's four and he can't write. I wrote on his behalf and then he signed it. <laughs> I took a pack of cookies that my kids had begged me to buy at the store the other day. So they were really sad because they were a limited edition cookie and they were sold out. And so it was really a sacrifice for him too. They were really excited to try these cookies. And so we wrapped a bow around the cookies, put the card in, and he said, I wanna carry them. He wanted to give them to her. And so we walked over to her house and right as we left my property, all of a sudden, I look over and I see blood just running down his nose. And he had had his hands on the cookies the whole time. And all of a sudden, he just has this blood running down his nose. And it's a steady stream. And I thought, oh no, oh no, no. <laughs> so anyways, we were in a hurry because we had dinner waiting at home. And my other daughter was about to have a little birthday celebration. And her friend was coming over. And so I thought, okay, let's go back to the house. Let's wipe your nose. And as we're walking back to the house, it turns into this gushing waterfall and blood is just everywhere. And all of a sudden he's wiping his nose on his sleeve and there's blood all over his shirt and it looks like a crime scene. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. So we go inside and he's just calm and not sure what's happening and he feels really bad. And at first I'm thinking, is this some kind of karma? <laughs> you know, Because he hurt his friend, what comes around goes around sort of thing. And then I thought, no, and I thought maybe this is the adversary interfering because he doesn't want my son to go apologize and he doesn't want this to happen and so he's trying to interfere with this. So anyways, I got him all cleaned up and 10 minutes later we head back on over and as we're walking down the stairs, I look down and I see that he had got blood all over the card and the cookies and the bow and I thought, oh, we can't give them bloody cookies. So we turn around and we go back inside the house and I wash off the card 
and I wipe off the cookies, I try to get it all off, and then another 10 minutes later we head back over. Everything happens for a reason, right? So the rest of their family had pulled up right as we were walking over and they saw Tatum coming and they said, oh, come inside. You know, you can come hand them to her yourself. So we walked inside and they were really sweet. They were really nice to him. And his cute little friend came over and she hugged him and he hugged her. And then the mom hugged me and then we were all hugging. And <laughs> in that moment, I was trying really hard not to lose it. I just felt like I was gonna cry. It was an emotional situation because of everything I had been through over the last few months with my son. And then seeing him turn a corner and then having this happen and then experiencing him experiencing forgiveness and seeing this sweet little girl just so easily forgive him and then seeing the love of my neighbors just their kindness and their understanding and it was just so much I felt so overwhelmed and I was trying not to look them in the eye because I knew if I looked them in the eye if they looked at me just the right way I was going to cry <laughs> so um, we, we walked back home and on the way home I got thinking about it and I was thinking about the blood and I thought, you know, there's always a message. What's the message in this? And as I got thinking about the drops of blood that I saw on his cookies, I started to think drops of blood, drops of blood. And all of a sudden I heard in my mind, I heard the Savior say, I shed my blood for you. I shed my blood for him. I shed my blood for this very moment. I did this because I love you. You don't have to carry these emotions. You don't have to carry this pain or your sadness. You don't have to carry any of this. Give it to me. I suffered so that you don't have to. I just started to feel overwhelmed with gratitude in that moment. I was so grateful and I looked down at my son and I just started to feel so grateful that he had this moment where he could experience forgiveness. He could experience what it's like to do something wrong and then go say sorry. And then that wonderful feeling when the other person forgives you and hugs you and tells you it's okay. That's kind of like what it is every time we experience forgiveness. When we repent, our Heavenly Father and our Savior, they put their arms around us and they hug us and they tell us it's okay, it's okay. He got to experience that at age four in that moment. And I know it was really profound for him and he was different the rest of the night. And you guys, today at sacrament meeting, the whole theme was about the atonement. So the speakers in sacrament meeting both spoke about the atonement. And then last night, my husband had me watch Ben-Hur with him, which had scenes about the Savior all throughout the movie. And in the end, it showed his crucifixion. And again, there was the atonement. And then that experience with my son and his bloody nose. And again, I'm thinking about the atonement. So that's very much been a reoccurring theme this week for me. And it's just been a reminder for me personally that I need to access the atonement even more than I already am and cast all my burdens, all my pains, all my negative feelings, all my stress, all my anxieties onto the Savior. He wants to take that from me and help me become new and be redeemed of that. I couldn't help but be grateful, but all these feelings just of the love of my Savior and Everything I had been through that week with my feelings and emotions in, in regards to my son and just parenting in general, I just had this moment and I was just taking it all in and I just needed some time alone to process all of this. But I was greeted by my family when I got back home and, and dinner was ready and I just knew I needed some time alone. And so I went into my room and I just cried. I just let it all out and I cried because I was happy. I cried because of the relief I felt. I cried because I was letting out all those feelings and emotions I had kept inside of me all week. And it was just all these different feelings and emotions at once. It was so powerful and I just cried and I cried and I cried. And then I came out and I didn't want to look at anyone because I, I needed to be done. I didn't have time to cry anymore because my daughter's friend was coming over and we were supposed to have this happy birthday celebration. And you know, I. I just couldn't be crying so I tried to hold it together even though I felt like there was more to come out and I don't cry very often so when I do it's like the floodgates open and it just all comes out <laughs> so so anyways I'm at the table and my kids can tell I'd been crying and I'm like please I'm hoping that they don't ask me if I was crying because you know that just sets it off <laughs> so I'm trying to just eat my dinner and not look at anyone and, and it was hard to keep it together but I made it through the night and at about 4 30 in the morning I woke up and I just felt I needed to get up and go into my prayer closet 
And so I spent about three hours in my prayer closet talking to the Lord about all of this. And it's just so weird when you're in there, how it feels like you were only in there for an hour and you come out and you realize, oh, it's been three hours, it's time to get ready for church. <laughs> so it's just strange how that happens. I forgot to bring my journal with me, so when I get home, I just wanna to read to you a page out of my journal. Okay, so I have my journal. And um, just a couple things I wanted to share in here. The first was from, oh, about a week ago. And I was writing about something in my journal. And it was in one of my prayers that I was writing. And I used these words. I was speaking about a certain aspect of my life that I wanted to see improvement in. And I wrote about that. It sort of feels boring and dull. So I used the word dull. And it's so funny because at the end of my prayer... So I wrote it and then I prayed it and I felt inspired to turn to page 205 of Jesus Calling. And here's my summary of what that page said. Keep walking with me along the path I have chosen for you. Together we will forge a pathway up the high mountain. Okay, that reminds me of the dream I had at the beginning of the year. The journey is strenuous at times and you are weak. All I require is for you to take the next step, holding my hand for guidance. Though the path is difficult and the scenery dull at the moment, so there was that word again, there are sparkling surprises just around the bend. Stay on this path. I have chosen it for you. It is truly the path of life. So it was a really comforting message from the Lord. You know, hang in there. I've chosen this path for you. Just trust me. Though right now, the scenery is a little bit boring. It's a little bit dull in regards to this aspect of your life. Things are going to get exciting. And I love how he words it here. There are sparkling surprises just around the bend. And it wasn't too long after I prayed this prayer and wrote this in my journal that I received some awesome invitations with some exciting sparkling surprises. <laughs> and so truly it was just around the bend. So this really gave me hope. So here's what I wrote in my journal. I know what you're feeling. I know what Tatum is feeling because I bled for you both. I bled for this very moment. Because of my blood, you can have peace. So it's funny, I asked the Lord if he had a scripture for me and I was sent to Philippians chapter three, verse 10. And here's what it reads. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made comfortable unto his death. And so that part of that scripture was talking about his resurrection and his atonement. And so again, there's that theme of what the Savior did for us and his atonement and his resurrection and that whole gift and the perfect plan and the reason why we're here. There it was again. Hey, so then this morning when I was in my prayer closet, I was praying about the situation with my son and just um, talking about everything that happened yesterday and just praying for areas where I can improve as a parent, kind of revisiting the many different challenges I've had during the last few weeks and how I handled them and if I could have handled them better and what I can do better next time. Just telling the Lord that I feel like there's more I need to do. There's more I need to do to help my son and to be a better parent. And so this morning I was prompted to turn to page 230 in Jesus Calling and here's what he said. Understanding will never bring you peace because I had prayed for peace by the way. That's why you need to trust me, not your understanding. You want to figure things out to have a sense of mastery over your life. But the world presents you with endless problems. As you master one, another one pops up. The relief you anticipated is short-lived. Soon you again begin seeking mastery instead of the master. The wisest of all men, Solomon, could never think his way through to peace. My peace is not complicated. You are always enveloped in it. Just look for me and you will feel it. So that was the summary of what I got from that page. It was exactly what I needed to hear today and maybe somebody out there needs to hear it as well. Something else I wanted to share with you was that 
I have been really wanting to focus more on my health and I feel like every now and then I have time to think about it and focus on it and then all of a sudden I get hit by a bunch of things and we have so much going on and it's summer and we have company coming over and I just kind of get thrown off all the time. I've been just really feeling lately I need to start focusing more on my health. I need to start focusing more on my health. and. It's funny because a few years ago, I've shared in many of my videos my 90 day challenge. Well, after my 90 day challenge was over, several months later, I wanted to keep up those awesome experiences and those awesome feelings that I'd had during that time. And so I had decided back then that I would fast every Sunday. I would fast every Sunday. And I had heard, but I'd never confirmed it myself, I had heard from a friend somebody who works with the apostles and they had shared that, that the quorum of the 12 they fast every Thursday I've never looked into verifying that I don't know if there's even a way to verify that but I thought well that's really interesting maybe that's their one day during the week where they focus on things that are really important that they need answers for and maybe that's the day they go to the temple so I decided back then I would fast every Thursday and every Sunday. Not only spiritually, I felt like it did a lot for me spiritually, but I also felt like it did a lot for my health. It was, it was really good for my health to kind of go through a cleansing every few days. I had a lot of amazing experiences during that time. And then at the beginning of the last school year, I just kind of slipped out of it. I just didn't do it as much anymore and, and um, would only fast a couple days a month and just every now and then and, and just, you know, as I felt like I needed to. Anyways, lately I've been pondering a lot. I've been pondering, Lord, what would you have me do to best take care of my health? And especially there was a certain day I went to the live Bible study event and I met this sweet woman and we've become friends since and she was a sweet Christian woman and we were talking in the parking lot when she walked up to me she put her hand on my belly and she said oh do you have a little bun in the oven when's it due and I said nope I don't <laughs> and I realized that the outfit I wore that day for some reason sort of looked like a maternity dress it really did I'm such a nice person you know I'm never quick to judge and I really gave her the benefit of the doubt and I, I, I wasn't offended but deep down I thought okay that's a sign I really need to do something about my health I really do I, I spend so much time focusing on spiritual things and family things but I don't spend a lot of time on myself and so I thought, I need to do this, it's time. And so I prayed, Lord, what would you have me do? Guide me to what it is you'd have me do because I, I spent a few hundred dollars a couple months ago on something that one of my holistic friends really felt would help me. And I felt like it was a waste of a couple hundred dollars. And so I ended up giving it to my brother. I just felt like the Lord knows me best. He knows what I need. And so the day that I prayed that, it was so funny how this works. I decided to go to the Preparing a People podcast, and that was the day that they had published um, podcast number 43, which was an interview with David Warwick. And the title of this is, David Warwick shares his experience with longer fasting for powerful revelation and better health. And I thought, huh. <laughs> so I listened to it. And towards the end of the podcast, he said, I lost a lot of weight this year. He said, I just got into this place last year where I went through the holidays and I lost my brother. My brother passed away and I was experiencing some depression and I was going through so much that I used food as my comfort and I gained so much weight. And he said, I was feeling it sort of spiritually. And I got to this place where I felt one day I need to change. I need to do something. And he said that he felt inspired to fast. He would fast days at a time. And I, the way that he explains it, you'll have to listen to the podcast. I have the link down below. But the way that he explained it was he learned how to make a drink that provided all the electrolytes and nutrients and so some days he would do an overall fast no liquids no foods and then other days it would just be a food fast and he would just drink those liquids that he made sometimes he would fast just a few days at a time and then go a few weeks and then he'd fast a few days at a time again and then go a few weeks and then he'd do a four or five day fast just whatever he felt like but he said the first time he did it he lost so much weight just in that short amount of time 
he felt that it was cleansing. It was very cleansing, not only physically cleansing on his body, but spiritually cleansing. And I started to feel it from head to toe. Yes, yes, this is what has been impressed upon my mind lately. I had been reminded just before listening to his podcast that there was that time when I was fasting more often every week. And I felt that it was cleansing me not only physically, but spiritually. And I thought, you know what? Maybe that's why I'm really struggling lately with parenting. <laughs> Maybe if I go back to fasting more often, it's really going to help me not only with my health and give me the strength and energy I need to parent, <laughs> but to help me out spiritually, to help me again gain a greater perspective of the bigger picture of everything in my life. And so I started to feel really good about that. Well then, it's so funny, after I listened to that, now keep in mind I hadn't typed anything into Google. I hadn't typed anything in about weight loss or any of this stuff, none of these keywords. I just happened to listen to this podcast, so then I decided I was cleaning the house and I, and I thought, well, I'll go into YouTube and see what videos pop up. So I go into YouTube and this very first video that pops up was a video called, <laughs> I Supernaturally Lost Weight. And it was an episode with Sid Roth. And I thought, oh my goodness, it seems kind of older, but I want to watch it. I want to watch it. So I started to listen to it, and it was really great. I put the link down below for that as well. And I'm listening to it, and it's a woman by the name of Lisa Bevere. She just shared her life experience of going up and down and going through the weight loss roller coaster and going through some emotional things. And towards the very end of her video, you know, the whole purpose of this was she was saying, I lost all this weight without supplements, without a weight loss plan, without even exercise. And she's saying, I'm not endorsing that, I just never had the time because <laughs> I was a full-time mom. I began to wonder, how did she do this? And she said the same thing. She fasted, she began fasting. And she actually prayed to the Lord, Lord, what's my ideal weight? What is it that you would have me weigh? And how would you have me go about doing this? And um, you'll just have to listen to it. I don't want to give it away, but it was just so incredible. And she began to fast. And not only did it cleanse her physically, but it cleansed her spiritually. And again, that was an additional witness for me. This is something that the Lord wants you to do. And it's funny because in my Q&A live video, I was talking about the three-day fast. And I had said in there, you know, only do it when you feel prompted to. And I'm telling you right now, I feel prompted to. I feel like it's what the Lord is leading me to do. And so I just wanted to share that with you. And then after recording this video, Sean Little Bear's last lecture for his eight-week course was the topic of fasting and its meaning. Remember, eight is the gate. I felt like this was telling me this is the gateway right here to what it is I'm seeking. This is it. And he shared some incredible suggestions and advice and wisdom about the different ways that you can fast and the purpose of fasting and, and different ways it's blessed him and what he's learned from his people in regards to fasting. And again, this was my third witness. There it was, three witnesses. Sometimes when you hit those places in life where you feel stuck, spiritually, emotionally, or physically, and we just need some breakthrough, fasting can really help with that. It can really create breakthrough. And I know that I teach that all the time. So I've started to feel like for me, if I can get back to doing it for at least twice a week again, I feel like it will better help prepare me for each week, going into each week. I feel like that's probably why I started to struggle this year with waking up every time I felt the Lord wake me up to go into my prayer closet. I struggled, I was tired, I was exhausted sometimes, and I couldn't always get myself to do it. I feel like fasting is really gonna help with that. It's really gonna cleanse my body and give me that, it's sort of like a reboot. I feel like it reboots your system, at least for me. Every time I fast, it's like my system got a reboot, spiritually and physically, emotionally, <laughs> mentally. Reboots everything, and I just feel brand new again. I just feel so good. So. I'm going to let you know how that goes. If anybody out there has had a similar impression, I'd love to hear your experiences. But um, yeah, I really feel like this is something that's going to create a lot of breakthrough in my life. And I feel like the enemy has really been targeting me lately and targeting our family. And this is something that will really help me spiritually. It's going to help with that spiritual warfare. Okay, so speaking of the Preparing a People podcast, 
so podcast number 42, there was an episode called Reading Heaven's Time Clock with Marilyn Light. I'm sure a lot of you listened to it. And and I remembered as I listened to that, I have heard of this before. I've heard of her before. And I drew a great interest in what it was she was talking about. So I just want to sum it up for you real quick who she is and what she does. So I'm just going to read it directly from her website. It says on her website, which is whitelightherbals.com, Did you know you were literally vibrationally coded to the stars at birth? Do you know you chose this timing in heaven before you were born? And it says, Thus there are some elections to be desired over others. An election of grace spoken of in Doctrine and Covenants 8498 and Romans 11, 1 through 5 has reference to one situation in mortality. That is, being born at a time, at a place, and in circumstances where one will come in favorable contact with the gospel. This election took place in the pre-mortal existence. And this is from the Bible Dictionary. She says, you have your own personally unique divine time clock constantly influencing you from the heavens. Your clock is so unique no one can be just like you for 26,000 years. The energies of planets and fixed stars are vibrationally coded within you at your moment of birth. Then, as the heavens continue to rotate, so do the timing of opportunities to grow and mature in your life. Do you want to discover your potential spiritual strengths, talents and gifts, mission in life, or purpose? Your love language or even life's greatest wound you will ever encounter and heal yourself of. Who doesn't want to know more about themselves and how to increase one's potential? Everyone has a calling in life. Which did you choose? She goes on to talk more about this in her interview and it was really fascinating and I have always believed, I know I've shared this in videos, I've always believed that everything has a purpose. Nothing is random, nothing happens by chance. The Lord has designed it all. Everything in this world and in this universe and in this life is designed to be a benefit to us. I've always believed that and I've always felt that there was a purpose to the stars and the constellations and the way everything was mapped out, the timing and the seasons, just all of it, that there's a purpose in everything and God can speak to us through those areas. He can speak to us and give us messages in the stars. He can speak to us and give us messages in the seasons through Mother Nature. He's always speaking to us because he loves us so much. I've always felt that our birth was time just right, that there is a reason why we were born at the time we were born, and that there's meaning in that for us. And so as I was listening to her interview, I just felt it from head to toe. I got my spirit bumps. And it's funny because I had mentioned in the past couple videos, I keep getting this feeling to look to the stars, look to the heavens for signs, look to the stars. And I didn't quite understand what that meant. I didn't know if it was a literal sign in the heavens or something that would soon come to pass. I wasn't sure, but I could feel it so strong. And I realized after listening to her interview, this might be for me. <laughs> and so I reached out to her and I messaged her and said, hey, I would love, I said, I'd love to have a natal chart reading. And all that's needed to do this is your birthday, the exact time that you were born and the location, the coordinates. And so there's, there's a science behind it. And so I reached out to her and she kindly wrote me back and said, I am so busy right now. Ever since doing that podcast, I now have a six month waiting list and I've got to figure something out. I've got to do something differently because I just don't have enough time to do all this. And so I said, go ahead, put me on the waiting list. No worries. And then later as I got thinking about it, I thought, well, she can't be the only one out there who does this <laughs> and maybe I can learn more about it or even do it myself. And what I loved about her is, is she is LDS, and so she has that LDS perspective, and um, I really like that. She, she had told me in her email, just go to my online classes, and you can learn how to do it yourself. And, you know, the classes are pretty pricey, so I thought, well, maybe I can learn to do this online. So I went on to YouTube, and I found a lot of videos out there that are free that teach you how to do this. And some of them have websites, so you can go into the website and plug in your information, and it'll print out your chart, and you can read it yourself. So I thought, maybe this is what I'll do. 
But as I got looking at it, I thought, well, this is kind of too much over my head. I'm not really an astronomer. And even though I love science, I was never really good at it in school. <laughs> so I got B's more than I did A's. So I thought, I think I'd like to have an expert just read mine for me. So this one particular video I was watching, I, I, I was really impressed with his information. He was really professional. So I reached out to him. He has a website and I'm going to share that with you. It's called MasteringTheZodiac.com and I've put a link down to it below. And his name is Athen Cimenti. I was really pleased with his work. So his price was about $40 cheaper. There's different options where you can Skype and do it live or he can just record it for you and send it to you. And I just chose that option and it's a little bit cheaper. And he has a window of one to three days. So he'll have it ready in one to three days. And on the third day, he delivered as promised. And in my inbox, I had my natal chart reading and I was so excited, you guys. And it was funny because I was actually trying to watch the Sean Little Bear online class and they were having technical difficulties because of a lightning storm in Oklahoma. So Sean didn't have any connection. So I was working out and I was like, now what am I going to watch? And then I saw that Athen had emailed me and he had this recording for me to listen to. And I was like, yes, I was so excited. So I listened to it and I just had to keep listening to it over and over and I would pause it and go back and pause it and go back and just soak it all in. But I really, really loved it. So I wanted to share it with you. Okay. So here's the kind of language that they use in these charts, which are clear over my head. <laughs> so I found out with my chart. Um, my north node is in the second house in Cancer, and my south node is in the eighth house in Capricorn. He explains what that means. And so based on the alignments of everything before I was born, it reflects that before I came here, before I came here to this earth, before this life, I was involved in deeper things. I was very much into learning and uncovering deep truths. I was very much involved in deeper dimensions. My strengths were related to healing. And so I started to imagine myself, maybe I was someone's guardian angel and I was assisting in their healing. <laughs> you know? It just felt really familiar as he was talking about this. He said that what it was I was involved in and doing before I came to this life, I took it very seriously. And it's funny because this very much matches my patriarchal blessing, which talks about my pre-earth life and some of the things that I was doing for my Heavenly Father that were very pleasing to Him. And so what I love about this is you can match it side by side to your patriarchal blessing and it's just another witness. I'm feeling the spirit bumps right now. He said something about me. Now, this is so funny because I was just talking about this the other day with someone and I was thinking about it. And I was thinking, you know, it's funny how a lot of times we marry our opposites. We marry people who help balance us out. So the things that we're good at, they're usually not so good at and vice versa. I was thinking about my own husband and how we're so different in so many ways. He's more into his financial responsibilities, taking care of the family, focusing on his career, you know, very logically minded, very good with numbers. And I'm more into spiritual things and emotional connections. <laughs> so we, we balance each other out that way. And you know, for years I used to struggle with that and I used to think, well, what would it be like if he was more like me and we could connect emotionally and talk about feelings and spiritual things and and these deeper mysteries that I love to learn about, which he has no interest in. <laughs> so I used to kind of always wonder what that would be like. And then recently I started to think, you know what? I'm actually glad that his strengths are my weaknesses and my strengths are his weaknesses because I feel like if we were too much the same, it would do both of us a disservice. I really started to feel one day, I started to feel really grateful that his focus could be on the finances and taking care of the family and the household so that I didn't have to worry, so that I could focus on the spiritual things. And and these are things I'm, I'm good at and I love and, and the things that I'm reading and learning about and studying and sharing with you, these all exercise my gifts. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. And so him being able to focus on his strengths allow me to be able to focus on mine. And so we're both able to nurture our strengths. And then everything I lack, he teaches me. And same with him, the things that he lacks, I kind of make up for that difference and I teach him. And I thought, oh, I'm so grateful that I don't have to worry about finances. And you know, I never lack anything I need, I've got it. He just um, really does well in those areas. And so I'm so grateful for that. So I 
been talking about that with other people. And I was having a conversation with a friend the other day, and I said, you know, she asked me a question, and I said, you know, I used to wonder why more people out there weren't on the same page as me, why people in my own family weren't on the same page as me. The things that I thought were so fascinating and interesting bored other people. And she had asked me, why do you think it is there's a lot of people out there who aren't spiritually awake? And so I said, you know, I used to wonder about that too. And I used to think about my own family and friends and neighbors and such. But then one day I realized that the reason I'm so interested in things of a spiritual nature and what some people might call spiritually awake is because that's very much a part of my mission. It's a part of my gifts, my strengths. It's what I was involved in before I came here. And it's very much a part of my mission while I'm here. The reason it doesn't resonate with so many other people is because it's not a part of their mission. Maybe their focus is to be on other things to help balance out their relationships and their families. You know, we're all here to do something a little bit different. We all have the same destination, but our journeys are very different. We shouldn't be hard on people who aren't on the same path that we're on and who aren't interested in the same things that we're interested in. And we shouldn't judge them and say, oh, well, they're not spiritually awake because maybe it's just not a part of their mission and their purpose. Maybe the levels that they're at spiritually pertain to what it is they were sent here to do. And their focus is just a little bit different. And that's why their strengths are different and their gifts are different. And we're not all the same. We're not all going to be interested in <laughs> in the same things. And, and that's okay. That's really okay. So those of us, I think, that have similar missions and similar gifts and strengths, we kind of gravitate to each other. <laughs> and that's the purpose of this channel. So he said something that I needed to learn in this life, sort of my life lesson, based on my chart and the way that everything is aligned, and it totally makes sense. Because my strengths are emotional and spiritual, I'm really good with emotional security and spiritual security but I am weak in physical security. And he says that doesn't necessarily always mean material things. It can just mean pulling from other resources. But he said that I'm here to gain a balance of that because that is my weakness and that is something I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn that aspect. I wanted to learn that characteristic. And I think about our Father in Heaven, how we came here because we wanna to learn to be like Him and we want to develop the qualities that he has. We come here to learn different things that we feel we need to learn. Some of us are here to learn patience more than others. Some of us are here to learn forgiveness more than others. Some are here to learn unconditional love more than others. <laughs> and so he said that that is something that I would learn here was how to balance the physical with the emotional and the spiritual. And it's funny because I just thought about that days before with my husband. I thought I'm so glad that my husband chose to be with me because <laughs> he balances me out. And I started to think maybe that's how our families were sort of formed. Maybe we all decided on the things that we felt we needed to learn and that we wanted to learn to better grow and better become more like our Heavenly Father. And so that determined when we would need to be born so that everything could be aligned just right to help us out on our journey. And so as we all decided the times that we would need to be born, it kind of grouped us together and we started to gravitate together and we decided who would be best to help each other with their different life lessons and missions they needed to fulfill. And we had so much of a love for each other and we had friendships before we came here. We just sort of gravitated that way and chose our families that way. I don't know, maybe I'm totally off on that, but it feels right. So he's talking about how it's really important to find this balance because unconsciously we want to go back to what we're comfortable with and what we're familiar with so whatever our strengths were and whatever things we participated in that we were really good at before we came here deep down sometimes we miss that and we want to go back to it even if we don't even realize it but we want to go back to those patterns and so we kind of revert back to those patterns when actually we're here to grow in those areas where we were weak and so he said, remember that. Remember it's really important to find this balance. He said that the south node helps us be aware of patterns from the past and helps us revert from them and create that balance. And so according to the natal reading of the time that I was born, my strengths are naturally truth, seeking truth, that sounds like me. <laughs> Depth, I'm looking for the deeper things, he said, that sounds like me. Spiritual and emotional intimacy, that sounds like me. 
he says openness. He said, you're very, very open-minded and you're very open to receive. And I said, yep, that's me. Healing is a strength. He says, you're very much a healer. He said, you're very much into the deeper things. And this was all a recording. So he couldn't hear me listening to it going, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this chart was spot on. So he talked about the new things, the things that I came here to learn that would be new for me. And he said, in this life, I would need to learn to develop material resources and security. So he talked about self-reliance, value, worth, persistence. He said, for you, it's slow and steady, slow and steady, and patience. I came here to learn patience. And I'm just laughing as I'm talking about this right now because that's how I feel with parenting. <laughs> I feel like every time I have one of those moments where I just want to go in my closet and lay down in the fetal position and <laughs> lock the door and grab a chocolate bar, right? Those are the moments the Lord is trying to teach me patience and I need to be grateful because that's what I came here to learn. That's why I chose the children that I have and the life that I have and the challenges that come my way because they would teach me patience. And the quicker I learn it, the quicker I get through those challenges. He said, sometimes we focus so much on the spiritual, but the physical is just as important. And he said, they're both important. We can't have the physical without the spiritual. We can't have a physical body without having a spirit inside of it. And when you think about the resurrection, one day when our physical body joins back together with our spirit, we will be complete, we will be whole, and it will be perfect. We really need to find that balance if we can in this life. Okay, so then he talked about my personality. He had never met me before. He'd never even seen a picture from me or heard my voice. So this was all just based off the chart. And so according to the chart, he said Gemini was rising in my chart, which means that my life experiences are helping develop the Gemini qualities. And so he explains in his videos how this is so different than a typical Zodiac, where I would be a Pisces because of my birthday being March 5th, I would be a Pisces, but this is different. This is something totally different and it's more scientifically accurate. So he said that I'm here to develop Gemini qualities. <laughs> and so, um, I need to learn more about Gemini's, but he said that this is increasing my personality. And he also talked about the Capricorn energy that that will also increase in my life, um, which would help me develop patience. He said that I am vulnerable through healing, transformation, understanding my deep self, and using my mind to uncover hidden things. He said that I would be naturally interested in things such as psychology, which is funny because in high school I wanted to become a psychologist and then later I changed my degree more towards social work and family studies. But according to this chart, I'm here to do what I did before. So I'm bringing all of those gifts with me and those talents and, and abilities with me and that part of my personality with me, but I'm here to use it in a new way. So then he went on to talk about the way that the sun and the moon were arranged when I was born. They were in Aquarius. And because of this, he said that I was born during the balsamic phase. And he said that my life theme is about my intuition and clearing. It's about trusting my intuition, trusting the spirit, and listening to the spirit to know what needs to be healed. So I thought that was incredible because that's exactly what I've been doing lately. And you know if you've been watching my last videos, I've talked about that. I've really put an emphasis lately on healing. And I've taken hours to write down in my journals all the things that I need to clear. Clear back from as early as I can remember in my life, like three years old. And writing down experiences and people that I need to heal from that I need to forgive and I need to let go. And it's taken quite a while to get through this list. That's exactly what I've been doing. He said my life theme is also about letting things go. That I'm here to learn to let things go. And I said that, <laughs> I'm feeling the spirit bumps right now. I just said that in a recent video that we need to let go and let God. We need to let go of trying to be in control of everything and let God be in control and put our trust in Him. And I think the reason I've been so passionate about that message lately is clearly because that's my own life theme. He talked about the Pisces being connected to the balsamic moon. <laughs> kind of sounds like we're talking about food. 
And um, he said, because of this, I do have those Pisces qualities, which of course I very much connect with. But he said, my personality is also about expressing my individuality. He said, there is an innovative and progressive side to myself. He said, because I came here to create change. There were things that I came here to sort of revolutionize. I'm starting to feel it. Oh my goodness, I'm feeling it, you guys. It just feels like this warm liquid pouring all over me right now. I'm just, it's just pouring down all over my head, all down to my toes. My spirit bumps are going on. I just feel like I'm in this warm shower right now. It's just so peaceful. But he said that I came here to create change and sort of revolutionize the world. And you know, we all came here to make a difference in one way or another. So really all of us can be part of change in some way. But he said that I'm forward thinking. I'm always thinking forward and that this is my strength. But he said, you're sort of a disruptor. You're sort of someone who's outside the box. And he used the term outside the norm, outside of the status quo. And I started laughing because that's the name of my album. <laughs> I recorded an album a few years ago and the name of that album is called Outside the Box. And I talk about on my website, my reason for choosing that name, but it's been very much a part of my mission and my theme. I don't know if you could call that my motto, but just thinking outside the box with everything, with, with God especially, not putting God in a box and saying, this is who God is, this is only who he is, and he's, and he's not any of these other things. But when we do that, we limit ourselves. And so my job, I felt like my mission with these videos especially and my books is to open up that box for people and say, God is actually so much more than that. He's so much more than we realize. And when we put him in a box, we not only limit him, but we limit ourselves and we limit our blessings and our potential. We limit our growth. So I, I just so much connect with all of this. That's totally who I am. I remember all throughout junior high and high school. If you've read my book, Successful Failures, I talk all about this. I didn't really connect with a lot of people in high school. I always felt the need to kind of be different. Even the way I dressed was different. <laughs> I look back at that 90s fashion and oh my goodness, it's a little embarrassing. <laughs> but, but I remember I just felt the need to be different. I kind of felt the need to stand out. I didn't want to be involved in groups or cliques. I was the type of person who just wanted a few good friends, just a few good loyal friends, and that was good for me. I didn't want to be involved in cliques or groups or any of that. I felt this need to kind of stay in my own space. I don't know how to explain this, but to sort of protect what it was I was here to do, that by going into other people's spaces and into other people's groups and cliques, would almost kind of blind me and blind what it is I was here to do. It would sort of overpower my identity. So I felt the strong need to create a very unique identity and hold to that. And that's very much what I did. <laughs> and I only had a couple of friends. So anyways, I was talking about this with a friend the other day on the phone and she brought it up and she said, when I watch your videos, I connect with you because what I feel from you, I feel about myself. And I get this feeling that you're like me, that we like to kind of stay in our own space. We've got this space and we trust it and we don't want to leave it and go attached to other people in their spaces. We, we want to focus on our space and we want it to grow. We're careful with what we pull into it. We use that gift of discernment. We're very careful with what we pull into it so that we don't taint or overpower or mute our purpose and our identity. And so she talked about experiences and I talked about experiences of how we, we've met certain people throughout our lives and if they had really strong energy, really strong personalities, maybe we're forming groups and trying to pull us into those circles and groups, we sort of began to distance ourselves from that because it just didn't feel right. I've always felt the need to kind of just do my own thing, which is why I do this channel, and just have that place where I can be myself and have my own space. Anyways, and so I said as far as, um, as far as my life theme of why I'm here and what I came here to do, I still need to feel secure and stable in that. So it would very much make sense that I would be that I would be very protective of that space. But he's like, even though you came here to change things and sort of disrupt things and and help create new ways of thinking, you need to have that stability and balance. You need to have that security and stability while you're doing that. He said that I value Aquarius qualities, so I'm gonna look into that more this week and learn about that. 
But he said that's being unique, being unique. I gravitate to people who have these qualities as well, and I value them. I value those sorts of relationships and people. He said, I very much get things done through my Pisces qualities, which has to do with intuition, compassion, love. Then he talked about my life wounds, sort of those challenges that you go through in life that are really there to help you, <laughs> that are really a benefit if you think about it. And it was, and it was so funny because, because he said my life wounds involved groups, networks, and communities, and sort of this need to be independent from them. And he said, as I learn to be more assertive and independent, this will actually be very healing for me. Now, this is so funny because in a roundabout way, I've, I've sort of shared some of these major experiences that have happened to me in my life in some of my videos. And one of them being a situation where I had to cut off some friendships. I had to cut off some groups of people and separate myself from them. And I had to be assertive in doing so. And at the time, it was very challenging for me to do that. It was, it was very difficult for me. But I found that, that this was kind of a repeating pattern. It happened to me not only once, not only twice, but more than three times <laughs> where I had had groups of people kind of invite me in and try to pull me in. And they sort of overpowered my identity and my purpose my individual mission of why I'm here and it started to become a distraction and I remember writing about this in my journal saying oh my goodness there's certain relationships I need to let go of and certain groups I'm involved in that I need to cut off because they're very distracting and I feel I'm supposed to be going this direction and putting my time and energy in this direction but these people these groups and online communities are pulling me in that direction and it's kind of conflicting with what my intuition is telling me and so I've had to be very assertive many times, but I feel I'm at a place now where I'm pretty good at that. And I can do it with a smile on my face and not have to feel bad about it one bit. So this very much spoke to me. And that's funny too, I, I may have mentioned this in my book. I know I've shared this with many people before, that growing up in junior high and high school and college, you know, they put you into groups and they give you these projects and assignments and papers that you have to write as a group. And I used to hate that. I used to hate that. I, I always felt that I worked so much better independently. And whenever I had to be a part of a group, I felt like I sort of got lost in that group. My ideas got lost in that group. My identity and my vision got lost in that group. And I hated that feeling. And I remember I used to think, why can't we just work alone? Why can't we do these projects on our own? Why can't I come up with my, my own theory, my own thesis, my own conclusions, right? Why do I have to do this with other people? So I always struggled with that. And even with business partnerships, if you read my books, you know, I've talked about that, that every time I got involved with other people, it never went well. But every time it was just me on my own, with a clear purpose and a clear understanding of my path, I was always successful. And that's exactly what my chart says. Okay, then he said that I need to be receptive about my work and my dreams and my own self-improvement. He said I very much need to surrender what's outside of my control and focus on living in the present. And that's definitely something I talk about often in my videos is letting go of the things we can't control and just focusing on the present moment and feeling that peace. That's probably why I'm so passionate about that message is because that's very much a part of my own life. He talked about freedom. He said, you very much value freedom. You need it and you enjoy it. But I thought, who doesn't, right? We all love freedom. But again, as I look back on my life, especially throughout my youth, I was definitely somebody who wanted freedom. <laughs> I wanted to feel free and be free. I've talked about this in my books. I remember very much hating art class because there was too many rules. We weren't really free to express ourselves. Even though art's supposed to be expression, right? It's supposed to be freedom of expression. There were these rules. We were taught how to paint certain ways using certain tools and we were graded on that. And if we weren't able to follow those exact rules and paint that certain way or draw that certain way, our grades reflected that. And even though I loved art, I didn't get the best grades in art because of that and that really bothered me. And same with writing. I took a creative writing class. I know I've talked about this before in my, in my book. I took a creative writing class because I was so good at writing. I used to write all the time and I loved writing and I had won writing competitions and I just loved to do it. 
and I took this creative writing class in high school and my teacher had a certain way he wanted us to write. This, this was his style of writing, this was what spoke to him, this is what he liked, and if we didn't write that way, well, our grades reflected it. And I remember there was this one boy who was a year older than me, and he wrote exactly the way this teacher wanted us to write. So he got straight A's, and the teacher would always call upon him to come up and read his stories and poems and have us applaud, and would use him as that shining example that we needed to be more like Corey. <laughs> And that would really bother me and I got C's in writing which is something I love to do and I'd always been told I was good at and then according to this teacher I was not good at it and I should never pursue it <laughs> and it's because he was putting us in a box I felt suffocated like I couldn't be free and so that would bother me and, and recipes bother me if you know me you know I love to cook and I seldom use recipes I love to cook outside of the box outside of the recipe book <laughs> I like to just create what feels good to me and tastes good to me, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. I toss it all in, I never write it down, I don't use measurements, and that feels free to me. I feel like I'm so free when I'm cooking and when I'm expressing myself in these other ways. And even with music, I took piano lessons, believe it or not, for about seven or eight years. I remember doing one of those competitions, I forget what they're called, but they were a big deal, and I got the highest rating two years in a row. I got a superior rating on my piano pieces, but I really struggled because I didn't like following the rules. I liked to play by ear and feel the music. I didn't want the music in front of me. I didn't want to do everything exactly as the teachers wanted me to do. And so when they were next to me, I felt like I couldn't play. and I'd always mess up and it would get into my head and I didn't enjoy it. I hated piano lessons. But when I was at home playing what I wanted to play, making up my own songs, I felt like I was free. And so my whole life I've seen this theme of not liking to be told how to do things, but being given that freedom to create and that voice to express myself how I feel I need to express myself. And I feel that's kind of the way our Heavenly Father is. I feel like He put us on this earth. He gave us the tools that we needed. He gave us the families that would support us. So He put us into these situations that He knew would help us and give us what we need. And then he gave us the freedom to choose, to go with it, to make our own choices, to use our free agency, and to grow into something beautiful and amazing. And I think we can learn a lot from that as parents, all of you parents out there who are watching this. Sometimes we feel the need to put so much control over our children, but that's not the Lord's way. That's Satan's way. And we'll find that not only are our children much happier, but we're much happier when we allow them more freedom to be themselves and not to be harsh on them or to judge them or criticize them for not being the way that we think they should be. Okay, so then he went on to say that I don't shy away from deep truths or communicating them. <laughs> and I've been hearing a lot of feedback lately from a lot of you who've been writing me and saying, you know, I don't know how you do it. You're so bold, you're so brave but I don't see myself as bold or brave. But I keep hearing lately, you're such a breath of fresh air. You just have this way of sharing the things that we're all feeling and thinking and experiencing, but we're afraid to talk about it. We're kind of afraid to put it out there, but you put it out there in such an incredible, beautiful way that we're like, yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I just didn't know how to say it. <laughs> and so I keep hearing that from a lot of you, and, and this is exactly what this chart is saying. That's something that comes natural for me, is gravitating towards the deeper truths and then communicating them. He said, matters pertaining to my home, my family, and my health are most important to me. And that is so funny because this week I actually put together a plan in my journal where he talked about how I wanted to create this space in my home that's more cultivating of peace and harmony and that that will really help with my parenting. <laughs> that will really be a benefit. And so I put together this plan to help create that in my home and with my family. I'm also focusing on my health right now. And so it's just so funny. This was just another witness. And that's what he said at the beginning of the recording. He said, if anything, the purpose and benefit of these natal chart readings are to just confirm to you things that you already know and that you already feel inside. But maybe you didn't know how to say it. These are just another witness, just a confirmation of what we already know. So they shouldn't really be too surprising. He said in matters pertaining to my home, 
family and health. He said, this comes easier to me than most. And that's funny because part of my degree was also child and family studies. So my, <laughs> my, my degree had three parts to it. it. It was a Bachelor of Integrated Studies and the three areas were social work, communication, and child and family studies. So there it is, that communication, home and family, <laughs> and then reaching out and helping and sharing with others. That's all a part of my gifts and my talents and what I love. He said, um, I'm very open-minded. I'm a very open-minded person and because of that, it creates new opportunities for me. And I've thought about all the incredible opportunities this year alone that have opened up to me because of having an open mind. I've, I've thought of all the friendships and the many opportunities and friendships that have happened because of going to those interfaith Bible studies. And I heard that there were people wondering why I was going to those and people in my own family who were worried about me and thought that I was going off the deep end or was going to join a different church or something like that. But, but they didn't understand this. They didn't understand that that's just a part of who I am, is I'm just a very open-minded person. I feel like as long as I'm open, as long as my heart is open and my mind is open, so I'm open to learning, I'm open to feeling, I'm open to receiving, as long as I'm open, I'm always going to be growing, I'm always going to be learning new things, I'm always going to be loving and receiving, and there's always going to be growth in that. And that's been true for me. And there's a lot of people out there who are afraid of that. They're afraid to do that, so they're more closed off. They're afraid to let in new things because they don't trust themselves or their discernment. They don't trust their own discernment and they don't want to be led astray so they're, they're not so comfortable with those things. But with me, I love meeting people from all walks of life. I love meeting people from all kinds of different backgrounds. I feel like everyone has something to offer. I learn something from everyone. There isn't one person I've ever met who I didn't learn something from. I think we really do ourselves a disservice when we don't look at the world that way, when we don't see all of our brothers and sisters as valuable to us and a benefit to us, when we put ourselves above other people or like to separate ourselves from other groups of people and think we're just too different, we don't have anything in common, there isn't possibly anything I can gain from being friends with them or whatnot, right? That's not how I've felt. I've never felt that way. My whole life, I've always been friends with the underdogs and the outcasts. And, and I talk about that in my book, that my friends were always the people that no one wanted to be friends with. The new kids at school, the people that sat in the very back of the classroom or sat in the corner, those were my friends. Those were the people I gravitated to. Anyways, he says when it comes to opportunities, I'm able to do the work and act on those opportunities. Where a lot of times people will get opportunities all the time coming at them, but they don't know what to do with them. They don't know how to act or how to respond or they're afraid, so they let those doors close. And with me, he's like, you know exactly what to do, you know how to get in there, you know you know what needs to be done, you know how you're supposed to play a part in that and you just get it done, you just do it. And that's very much who I am. Okay, so then he talked about this year, 2018, because that was something I asked. I said, I want to know about this year specifically because I feel this is a really important year for me personally. I've had a lot of dreams and a lot of awesome experiences that have pointed me in that direction. And he said that this is a great year for learning, especially things that have to do with the stars, science, philosophy, those types of things. He said that this year I would find myself spending more time alone working on more spiritual and creative things. And that's funny because I said to someone the other day, I said, I kind of feel like a hermit lately. <laughs> like over the past few months, I spent so much time on these creative projects and spiritual things and, and my videos and my blog posts. I put more of an emphasis on that this year than any other year for some reason. And so I kind of feel a little bit like a hermit. And that's exactly what he was saying. <laughs> he said, um, I have a lot of motivation and a lot of inspiration, especially this year. That rings true for me. I will feel the need to retreat at times and listen to my dreams and develop my intuition. And that's something I've spent a lot of time doing, not only in my prayer closet, but days like this where I get in my car and I just go park somewhere at a park and I just ponder and I think and I write things down in my journal and I focus. And I've really made an effort this year to develop more of those spiritual gifts pertaining to my intuition. So when a random thought comes into my head or a random song or just an image pops into my mind, 
A few years ago, I never thought to do anything with that. But now I know to write those things down and ponder on them and I always get a message out of it. And that's helping me develop those gifts and develop my intuition. He said this year specifically, I would notice that my focus was naturally on my home, my past, and my health. And I thought, oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> That's exactly what I've been working on this week. My health, healing things from the past, and creating a home filled with peace and harmony. I mean, if you read my journal, that's exactly like bullet point for bullet point what I've been writing. And that's exactly what my chart says would be my natural focus for this year. And he said, because I have fire and water energy, that focusing on my home and family would actually help recharge me. And that's probably why I've been drawn to that lately. I've been feeling this need to reboot my systems with, with the fasting, I talked about that. But also being able to fill up my home with that peace and harmony, more so than ever before, I really feel like will energize me and recharge me when I'm at home, which is where I spend most of my time. And then he said in the recording, you probably have some goals right now that you're working on pertaining to your home and family matters. And I thought, how did he know? <laughs> well, the only way he knew was from reading my chart. Okay, then he talked about what led me up to where I am right now. What led me up to where I am today. This was awesome because it perfectly coincided with what's in my journal. <laughs> and so he said, about seven to seven and a half years ago, so this would have been around 2011, he said, my life was very different than it is today. And that is so true. That was before my 90 day challenge. That was before I came on this journey that I'm on now. I was in a completely different phase of my life with, with other interests. I was involved in other things that were important to me at the time, but definitely not where I'm at today. And so we talked about that. He said, he said around 2011, your life was different. But since then, it has changed. I remember around that time, and, and it's easy to remember because we were living in our old house, in our old neighborhood, and around that time, around 2011, this was around the time when I wrote my book, Successful Failures, and I received all of that inspiration to put that book together and, and share that story, and that took my life in a new direction. I felt like, I felt at that time, I have this message that I'm supposed to share. Prior to that, everything that I did had to do with marriage and relationships. And you know, you know, I had my first book, How to Date Your Spouse. So I would constantly go around teaching classes and seminars and, and speaking at events with everything that had to do with marriage. And right about this time, I didn't have that passion for that topic anymore. I felt like that first book that I wrote was to help open up the door for writing for me, for writing books, and it was to help open up that door for me and, and teach me how to do this. But I needed something to start with. If you've read my book, Successful Failures, it talks all about that. But anyways, after I published that book, How to Date Your Spouse. I mean, it was an awesome journey. It was in all major bookstores. My book was carried in Deseret Book and Siegel Book and Amazon and um, Barnes and Noble and bookstores all over the country. And it was, an, it was an awesome experience. But after a while, I felt something shift. And I felt that my, my passion was no longer in, in talking about marriage and relationships. <laughs> And I felt that shift happen when I wrote Successful Failures, which is around 2011. So he said, since then, things have changed. Um, I've cleared some things and healed some things. That book was very healing, and that was the main reason I wrote it, was it felt like I have this message, and by writing it out and putting it out there to the world, it will be very healing. But not only will it be healing for me, it will be healing for those who read it. So he said that this started some new beginnings, he said, I'm in the next period of another seven years, and I'm in the first quarter of this lunar cycle, and with that comes new beginnings. So this new shift that took place this year for me is all about new beginnings, new gateways. Well, what have I been talking about? I'm feeling it <laughs> all year long. I've been saying over and over, this is a year of new beginnings, of shifting, of new gateways. It's 2018, eight is the gate. And um, I've been really strong about that and passionate about that clearly because naturally that's what's been happening in my own life. 
something shifted a few months ago and I'm, and I'm going in this other direction with this new opportunity. Well, as I thought about that, I thought that very much sounds like everything that's going on with the Honoring America Tour with Lynn Reidenauer and that whole Honoring America Tour that, that I'm doing with him. And that's a four-year tour. So it very much reflects what is in this chart. So he said, I need to build momentum over these next seven years, which won't be hard to do. And I'm at a place right now where all this momentum is starting to just pick up speed, pick up speed, and I'm starting to see the fruits of my labors. I'm starting to see this harvest come forth, which is so true. I've been writing that in my journal as well. So he said, in seven years, I'll be at the full moon phase, which will be a harvest of everything I've developed over the previous seven years. So he said, I'm halfway there right now. I'm halfway there. So I'm already starting to experience a lot of those fruits and a lot of that harvest. So it's so important to set goals now. And that is so funny because I was just saying that the other day. I was writing in my journal and I just was thinking about how things that used to be more difficult for me, I used to have to put a lot of effort into the things that I'm working on. Even with my videos, a little over a year ago, I only had about 50 subscribers. Right around the time this phase happened, so it was right around March and April, everything shifted and all of a sudden just this momentum picked up and all these subscribers started coming in and coming in and I no longer had to put the effort into it that I was putting into it before. I, I would just put my effort into the things I was creating and then put it out there and just naturally reap the fruits of that labor. So I've noticed that, I've noticed even with my business, a year ago, looking, looking back just a year ago, I had to put so much more effort into it and to share it with people and to tell people about it and at times it was exhausting at the end of the day and now I, I don't ever advertise, I hardly ever talk about my products, I don't, I don't really share them with other people. But every week sales continue to come into my website which keeps me very busy. But I really felt that lately. I felt this change where I don't have to put as much effort into everything like I did before. All I need to do is put my focus, time, and energy into the things I'm creating and then just put them out there. And right away, I notice the fruits of my labor. I feel that harvest coming in. It's just been really awesome. Okay, and then and then he said that I'm I'm coming to a place now where I'm where I'm wanting to develop new gifts and I'm focusing on learning and cultivating new and additional spiritual gifts. And that's very much true for me. I want to share an experience that just happened two days ago. So my ministering companion and I were on our way to minister. <laughs> and as I was driving over there, the weirdest thing came into my mind. It was so random. And that's why I'm telling you when these things happen. I'm learning how to develop this gift. And so it just takes practice. But all of a sudden it came into my mind, that song Mamma Mia by ABBA. I was never really into ABBA. I mean, I'm a child of the 80s and 90s. <laughs> so I started thinking about that. And then I thought about my ministering companion. And I started to think, I have a feeling she really likes ABBA. I have a feeling that that's her thing, that she likes ABBA. And she likes the song Mamma Mia. <laughs> and then I started thinking, I wonder what year she was born. And I, I think she was a child of the 70s. And anyways, as I'm going through this in my mind, I'm like, that's strange. Anyways, I pull up to the house, I get out, and and my ministering companion standing out there talking to the sister we were going to visit. And they're in the driveway talking, and I walk right into their conversation, and guess what they're talking about? <laughs> they're singing the song Mamma Mia by ABBA. <laughs> and right after they do that, my, my companion says, I just love ABBA. I mean, I was a child of the 70s. They're from my generation. I just love ABBA. And I just busted up laughing. And I said to her, you're not going to believe this, but on the drive over here, I actually said in my mind, I have a feeling Kathy really likes ABBA and she likes Mamma Mia. And I was imagining you singing the song and wondering if you were a child of the 70s. <laughs> and then I pull up and that's exactly what you're talking about. And I just thought it was so funny and I really feel like that's part of another spiritual gift I'm starting to develop so I'm kind of learning how to use that it very much matches what this chart is saying he said since the beginning of 2008 I've been taking relationships more seriously cutting off the old ones that don't serve me and starting new ones now that's so funny too because I've met so many new people this year that I really feel like are a piece to my puzzle and I've met some 
just incredible people this year who are in communication with me on a weekly basis. And um, I've never had anything quite like this before. So this year has definitely been very different than all the other years, which again, matches what this chart is saying. I've got some new friends from another church that I'm meeting up with next week and they want me to come down and go to lunch with them and they've been texting me almost daily and just these types of relationships where they're genuine, people really care, you feel that they're not on the surface relationships. These are people who really have something to contribute to my purpose and I really feel a connection with them and I'm um, just some incredible people so this couldn't be more true. So he said from 2016 to 2017, I worked hard and I was more focused on routine. And this is so true. I fasted twice a week on, on those certain days, every single week I had my routine. I was up every morning at 3.30 a.m. in my prayer closet. I had these routines that worked for me. And it's funny because this year has been different, <laughs> not so much. But he said over the last 14 years, I was focused more on working on myself, which is so true because I can't, I spent the last few years doing some really deep healing just on some certain areas of my life. I know I've talked about that in past videos, but some big things that happened to me a few years ago where it really took me a long time to heal from that. And my appointment with Mike Simpson at the beginning of this year really helped sort of close up that healing. But he said all of that inner work that I did will start to reflect now in my outer work, which I really do feel like has been the fruits of these videos. So he said, ever since October, you've been feeling more inspired. And I thought about <laughs> my videos that I shared back in September and October about Halloween and how everything from around that time, from the eclipse to Halloween, everything that I shared in that window really created a new inspiration for me and shifted me in a new direction. And I started to feel more passion with making these videos. Prior to that, I didn't make as many and, and I didn't make them as often and they definitely weren't as long. But now if you've noticed, they're way more often. They're over double the amount of length they used to be. <laughs> so I think that really reflects my passion for making these messages. But he said, where I'm at now, I'm gonna be able to start having more fun with the things that I'm passionate about. And I've noticed that. I've noticed that, as I've said, I've not had to put as much effort and hard work. It doesn't feel hard with the things that I'm doing like it used to. So I'm able to have more fun with it. And I've, I've been saying that a lot lately in my prayers. You know, Lord, I'm really enjoying this season of my life. I'm really enjoying where I'm at right now in life. I'm really enjoying the things I'm passionate about. Well, this was interesting too. He said, ever since April of this year, more spiritualization, <laughs> that's a word I don't say very often, has been washing over me. And I thought back to April. That was when the Firm Expo took place. And when I went to the Firm Expo and I met Lynn Reidenauer and I got to hear Sean Little Bear speak for the very first time and I was so excited. And I shared all that incredible information in that video. And it was around that time I felt an increase spiritually. So again, this reflects everything to a T. But he said this year I'm coming to a place where I'm being more receptive. And I feel like that very much has to do with the spirit. I feel like this year I've been way more receptive to the spirit than I've ever been before. And I've been willing to look at things in a whole new way and from different angles and perspectives and it's really been a benefit. But he said a whole new chapter has started for me this year and that has to do with being receptive, self-expression, being more sensitive and intuitive. And that's exactly how I feel about this year. That was my dream at the beginning of the year. I couldn't agree with this more. But he said what comes out of this period is a whole new aspect of my personality that will go forward with me throughout the rest of my life. And that was it, that was my chart. It was so incredible. Just amazing that it really just confirms personality traits, goals, strengths, weaknesses, life lessons I feel I've been learning my entire life, patterns that very much matched my patriarchal blessing. So I absolutely enjoyed this. And it's funny because just like I learned from my appointment with Mike Simpson at the beginning of the year, hypnosis, especially what he does, is nothing like what you hear it to be. It's nothing like it is in the movies or what you've been told it to be. I was able to receive that healing in our appointment before ever needing to do hypnosis, so he never did it on me, 
but I watched him do it on my children and it was so different than what I thought it would be. It was so simple. All it was was him talking in a soft voice and just relaxing my children and just relaxing them and it was a lot of imagery imagining nature and waterfalls and beautiful things and just slowly calming them down and then asking them questions that's all it was <laughs> you know in the movies you see people dangling a clock and you see their eyes going funny and you see them acting like chickens and monkeys and um, it's nothing like that at all at least at least what he does nothing like that at all and so I think when we're close-minded we close ourselves off to these opportunities and these areas of growth that can really help us in our lives and I feel it's the same way with this natal chart reading when you hear about stars and you hear about astrology you think of things that are connected to fortune telling and telling your future and who you should marry and on what days you should do certain things and basically telling you exactly how to live your life, which takes away that free agency and can really mess with your purpose. And this is nothing like that. This is simply reading and understanding science and the way that the stars and the planets are aligned at the time of your birth to understand the way that you were created, or as Marilyn Light says, the way you were vibrationally coded. <laughs> but basically everything that makes us unique. Okay, so just a little update. Lynn Reidenauer has put together this book that we're going to use for the tour. And this is a book that kind of explains his story and his purpose with this tour and what it is he's trying to do to unite all these different people together and build those bridges and create that healing. And I read this book before because he sent me a digital copy, but he also mailed me this paperback copy. So anyways, I wanted to share with you something from this book that I really enjoyed. The title of this section in his book is called Open and Free Flowing Meetings. So he's talking about the early meetings of the church, the LDS church. And he says, though there was structure, early saints meetings were open and somewhat free flowing. On April 6, 1878, Wilford Woodruff writes in his journal, the Mormon prophet was presiding. Joseph requested the congregation to speak their feelings freely and pray according to the spirit. The saints began to open their mouths and they were filled with language and to edification. One a prayer, another an exhortation, some a doctrine and a psalm, others the gift of tongues, some the interpretation of tongues. Prophecy was also poured out upon us. The night was spent gloriously by the saints. Much of the gifts of the gospel rested upon us. One brother clothed with the gift of tongues laid his hands upon my head and prophesied great blessings upon me. Another brother possessing the interpretation of tongues uttered it unto me to my joy and consolation with the many blessings pronounced upon my head. Much prophecy was uttered upon the heads of many saints in other languages and was interpreted which was glorious. This day and night was spent gloriously and whose scenes will long be remembered. Okay, so he's making an emphasis. You'll notice a theme here as I read these different experiences from the early history of the church, that the meetings, the church meetings, were very long and went into the late evenings and sometimes into the early morning of the next day. So they weren't like the regular three hour blocks that we have now. And a sacrament meeting wasn't just an hour. <laughs> they were just led by the Spirit and went as long as they needed to go. He writes, he says, there seemed to be no time restraints in their worship services, nor a predetermined set structure. Continuing on with the journal entry, he writes, unceasing praises swelled our bosoms for the space of half an hour. We accordingly closed the service and returned home about two o'clock in the morning. Okay, another one. On January 4th, 1836, Joseph recorded, many of the others saw glorious visions. Angels administered unto them as well as to myself. This all lasted until nearly two o'clock in the morning. So there it is again. <laughs> so these, so it was very common for these meetings to go well beyond the middle of the night. On March 30th, 1836, there was a meeting conducted in the Kirtland Temple with over 300 saints present. It is recorded, the brethren continued exhorting, prophesying, and speaking in tongues until five o'clock in the morning. So this was pretty normal. Could you imagine nowadays attending a regional conference, a state conference, or a fireside, 
and it lasting until five o'clock in the morning, that would be unheard of. <laughs> so he goes on to talk about how the meetings back then, how different the meetings from the early history of the church were as compared to today. We've seen a lot of changes over the years. Now I had read a blog post about this not too long ago, I wanna say sometime last year, where I talked about the gift of tongues and I had read Brigham Young's journal. I had been led to read it and as, I, and as I was going through the different entries, I was finding these exact journal entries that he's sharing in his book. So I'll put a link to that post down below if you wanna read that. He says, about the 8th of November, 1832, I received a visit from elders Joseph Young, Brigham Young, and Heber C. Kimball of Menden, Monroe County, New York. They spent four or five days at Kirtland, during which we had many interesting moments. At one of our interviews, Brother Brigham Young and John P. Green spoke in tongues, which was the first time I had heard this gift among the brethren. Others also spoke, and I received the gift myself. And so he goes on to share many journal entries of the early saints and apostles sharing experiences where they were in meetings and it was very normal for church members and leaders to start speaking in tongues and unknown languages and for other people to be able to interpret them. And I thought, how interesting would that be nowadays in our day and age <laughs> to go to a, a sacrament meeting and throughout the meeting people standing up and just speaking in unknown languages and then people interpreting that and people all around you prophesying. It's so interesting to think that this was actually the norm during the early history of the church. And in one particular journal entry, Oliver Cowdery gives an account, speaking of the dedication of the temple. He says, I saw the glory of God like a great cloud come down and rest upon the house and feel the same like a mighty rushing wind. This sounds just like the experience that, that the apostles describe in the book of Acts. I also saw cloven tongues like as of fire rest upon many, for there were 316 people present while they spake with other tongues and prophesied. Oh, this was an account of Leonard J. Arnington. And there's just so many incredible experiences from the early members of the church and the early leaders that share how common it was to have angels attend their meetings and prophecies to take place, not just from leaders, but just from random members of the church, people prophesying, people speaking in tongues, people being healed, people seeing clouds of glory, people seeing angels, right? And I was just thinking, if that's what a church meeting was like today, <laughs> I think it'd be a lot more easier for us to stay awake. And I think the conversion rate would go up quite a bit. Okay, so he ends with this beautiful testimony. He writes, I was also impressed with the stories of individuals. Hear the story of a little girl, Priscindia Huntington. Priscindia Huntington describes her experience. A little girl came to my door and in wonder called me out exclaiming, the meeting is on top of the meeting house. I went to the door and there I saw on the temple angels clothed in white covering the roof from end to end. They seemed to be walking to and fro. They appeared and disappeared. The third time they appeared and disappeared before I realized that they were not mortal men. Each time in a moment they vanished and their reappearance was the same. This was in broad daylight in the afternoon. A number of children in Kirtland saw the same. And if you look at a lot of the early hymns, they wrote about these experiences in the hymns. You'll hear a lot about these spiritual gifts and tongues and angels, and it's very much a part of those early hymns that were written. And I just get this feeling that in the not too distant future, we may begin to have more of these incredible experiences, not only personally in our lives, but collectively as a church. You know, I just feel that that's the way it needs to be in order for the Savior to return, that to have the earth ready for Him, we kind of need to be in a place like that again, where we can exercise those incredible spiritual gifts and where the veil can be thin for everyone. And I really feel like someday in the not too distant future, that these are experiences we will hear about again and witness ourselves. And I think those will be exciting times but I believe that's absolutely how it will be during the millennium when the Savior is ruling and reigning upon the earth. I truly believe that that veil will be gone 
and that we'll be conversing back and forth with heaven and amazing things are going to happen and I can't wait. Thanks so much for joining me today, you guys. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you have a wonderful week and I will see you next time.